<laughs> Boy, I am washed out. Look at me. So what's really washed out is... Ah, the there's the tree! Okay. Hello. Or shouldn't you read it after yeah, you? Yeah, I've got it ready. I'm ready. I'm just ready. Hello everyone, today is July 2nd. The Jesus Candle is on. 2020. Just so you know. And we're reflecting on um, her recollection of John 6, 16 through 21. Ready? Okay. <laughs> she doesn't care if you're actually ready. You have to pause the video if you're not ready because she can't hear you. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait with him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Capernaum, however you want to say that. So, um, so I think it's kind of interesting. Capernaum. He had just done the feeding of the 5,000 in the last section, right? And he <clears> slipped <throat> away into the hills. Slipped away into the hills, so they went and crowned him king. <gasps> and then he walked on the water so quickly. <laughs> Uh, that's interesting. We didn't see that. Okay, so anyway. I don't know what you're seeing. So, they're like waiting. All of those 10,000 or more people are gone. And they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're like, I guess he's not coming. And I think that's funny. They just like left without him. Like, they know he what can take he care do? of himself. Yeah. So, he's going like, to find his own ride home, I guess they're thinking. <laughs> And they're going to stay the night in the hills. I yeah, maybe I think he's going to stay the night in the hills with God, and they're going to come back for him in the morning, back on the boat. He's that kind of guy. Also, I'm not very... The shirt. The shirt? The, the teal one. I'm wearing <laughs> you a always wear. different shirt. I know it's shocking. <laughs> yeah. I'm also wearing all white today, so that's weird. You better show the all white outfit. I have this... And I have white shorts and white legs. I have white legs and I have white socks. I don't know if you can see. You can probably see my socks. So I'm wearing a lot of white today. I think this is the most white I've ever worn at once. <laughs> but as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. Okay. Let's imagine that time. Imagine that. That seems kind of scary to me. I'm not really a boater, but that seems scary to me. But they were boaters. They were boaters. They knew what they were doing. So, there's that. They had rowed three or four miles. That's pretty far. Imagine rowing three or four miles in a storm. When suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. He's like, wait up. You guys forgot me. It's like when you miss the bus and you're running after the bus. Oh, that's so bad. That's Jesus running after the boat. So, actually, to contrast the the imagery that Anna's sharing with you, um, I was reading a little bit about in, in the commentary. I think it was the, um, oh. Hang on. I got a notification. Got a notification. I got to get that out of the way. Um, I think it was the cultural cultural commentary, cultural backgrounds commentary. The study Bible study Bible commentary that was saying um, that it, it said, and I don't remember the references on this, so I can't give you any specifics. You can look it up for yourself. It said that <clears throat> in the Old Testament, oh, we should talk about the Old Testament again. Let me tell the thought, and then Anna has an idea for you. Don't say it yet. I don't know if that's not an idea for another time. Okay, maybe another time. Maybe at the, when we finish. The maybe passage. at the end, yeah. When we finish the passage. Yeah, we won't interrupt the passage. But it said that in the Old Testament, that um, the prophets would sometimes split waters, like when Moses split the water and um, of the Red Sea and the Egyptians were coming after them. I don't know if there were other references. I can't remember. But it says only God ever walked on the water. Except for, you know those bugs? <laughs> the water bugs. Can you hear Chloe laughing? Chloe, say hi. Say hi. You know the water bugs? They're like, yeah, Ching! yeah, they're like, in the water. Yep, that was Jesus. Yep, that was Jesus. Except for, except for he was being God. So, um, so what I was like, this is kingly, this is like king Why of the universe. 
No, God is the king. Ever walk on water? What does king and walk on water have to do with each other? God is the king. That's what it says. We're, we're going to read you a little quote with the text of king. Anyways. I don't buy it. Okay, just hold that. Up. I've never known any kings who walked on water, nor have I ever known any okay, king. Okay, we'll just stick with this was deity. This showed that he was God. Now, listen to this. They rode three or four more miles uh, on water toward the boat. They were terrified. Now the commentator pointed out they weren't really that scared of the storm, but when they saw Jesus, they were terrified. I've seen storms before. I've never seen anyone walk on water. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're scared of. Are they scared Jesus is going to fall in? Maybe Are it's they that scared that he's a ghost? Remember what C.S. Lewis said, the new, the fear of the uh, spirit world. Yeah. New, what was the word for that? Pneumatic? Pneum, pneum, remember? Pneumulus. Something. Wait, wait, we need at least tell them where they can learn about that. What book was it? Was it Surprise by Joy? Numinous. I think it was pain. The problem with pain. The problem of pain. It might have been. The numinous. I think that's what it was called. Something with the new. I think this may have been that kind of a fear. Fear of like the spirit world. That people have always been afraid of that. Even whether they're religious people or not. But he called out to them. Don't be afraid. I am here. So this is really cool. The commentary said that in the original language, when he said, I am here, he actually said, I, I am. am. Which, y'all remember that? Go ahead. Oh, my Old Testament folk. When he said, I am, he said, who are you? He said, I am. When this was when Moses, Moses was talking to Pharaoh to get the, it freed from the Egyptians. And he said, I was sent by, who were you sent by? And he said, I am. That's who God t said his name was. His name was I am. Pharaoh, Pharaoh. So he's kind of pointing again oh, towards his deity. People go. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Pointing again towards his deity by saying this I am thing. Uh, let's see. They were care I am. Okay. And then I love, I love this verse. It says, then they were eager to let him in the boat. I like that. When they figure out this Jesus and he's like, like I'm here. Yay! Come on in Jesus. Um, and then it says, and immediately they arrived at their destination. Now I'm going to read you a little piece out of this commentary. This it's is a, the John commentary you out can of the figure it series out. called The Bible Speaks Today. That's the series. They have one on uh, most of the books, I believe. It says, this arrival was apparently a further miracle, for immediately on Jesus entering the boat, they find themselves immediately at their destination. I don't think it says immediately twice. That was my bad. The appropriateness is well caught by Godet. This is another author he's quoting. One can scarcely imagine, indeed, that after an act of power so magnificent and so kingly, let's come back to that, as Jesus walking on the waters, he should have seated himself in the boat and the voyage had been laboriously continued by the stroke of the oar. At the moment Jesus set foot on the boat, he communicated to it the force victorious over gravity in space, which had just been so strikingly displayed in his own person. I love that. That quote is so good. I've never seen any king walk on water. I don't buy it. So it's interesting that it's he's repeated. Remember how the last section ended is that he was trying to escape them crowning him king, of course. That's not the way he was meant to be king. So. Back here? When Jesus saw they were ready to force him, him to, to be, be their king, okay. he slipped away into the hills by himself. That was 615. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Was there anything else we wanted to touch on? Away. Oh, sorry. It's anything else? in your own face. I don't know. I'm going to put a plug in. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to do an extended time of reflective meditation with this with this piece of scripture it will be a separate video and a longer video intended for you to slowly and thoughtfully pray through this scripture i think this is i had a, a time of solitude yesterday afternoon with the scripture and it is amazingly powerful for reflection so really looking forward to that don't that's not this is not the place for that that's a whole separate deal so um, did you do this because she loves you she loves jesus what am i doing Making a meditation for one. You guys can check that out. Link will probably not be in the description. <laughs> Unless I can talk in into doing it for me. I'm not going to do it. You can do it. It's your life. Yeah. It's my life. But you loved me. 
I That's a mo- emotional manipulation. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. It's okay. I do okay. love you, though. Are you going to talk about your Jewish idea now? Okay. Or are we saving that? Right. Should we officially end this video and then make that an, an appendix? I mean by just saying, we praise you, Jesus. We can praise him at the end as well. We'll praise you again at the end. We are still praise him. Okay. Picture this. Here's what I don't like. Is reading the Gospels and already knowing what's going to happen. That's no good. You're reading it, and they're not surprising because you read Bible stories, but you don't understand the power of it when you're like five years old. Can I and can I add in uh, just a little yes. reality piece here? Yes. So sometimes when we're doing these Bible readings together, and Anna sees where it's going, like today, she saw that this was going to be the Jesus walking on the water. She'll be like, "Oh no, this one." But, like, she likes the story, but she yeah. still is like, oh, no. I, I I don't know what the oh, no is, because you like the story. The oh, no is I know where this is going. So you're sad that it's the plot is ruined. Yeah. Is that what the oh, no yes. is? And you don't get to experience it freshly. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Anyway, so when you're five years old, you don't, and they're just telling you it out of context, that's not surprising or exciting. They're like, Jesus can walk on water. And you're like, okay, because whatever they tell you, you believe. And adults can tell you whatever they want. They can be like, unicorns are real. And you can just be like, yeah, they are. So anyway, what am I trying to say? I don't know. Talking about We should not be telling the kids Bible stories until... They're old enough. This is just a theory. She's not advocating this. She's just exploring We're just think, a thinking, thought. That's what if all. we did this? Yeah, Pic- that's, this is a what picture if. That's this. all. Picture I said, this. I said, picture this at the beginning. Oh, okay. I missed that's that. the I, disclaimer. I missed the disclaimer. Anyway, and we, we, instead of telling them Bible stories, we told them, like, Old Testament stuff and, like, stuff about Jewish stuff. History, History, culture, geography, stuff they wouldn't know, but that make the Gospels more powerful that we find in the all the little appendixes of all our many study Bibles. Would they get to learn the Old Testament, right? Yeah, they might get to learn the Old Testament, and um, but it'd be hard because reading through the Old Testament is really good. You know, you, you not mean, you getting don't random s- stories at a time. Reading through it is really good. But if you have random who knows when which kid will be there, that'll be hard. I'm missing the last point you're making. I don't get it yet. If the kids are not there regularly reading through the old Oh, they would miss out on stuff. Yeah. Church should be that way, you guys. Church should totally be that way. Hey, we could do a live stream so they could watch at home if they miss during the week. (laughs) You know, the way church is going now because of quarantine, that there's a lot more live stream options. Yeah. So we were talking about what if. <laughs> so basically, we would just be making them Jewish, but like Old Testament Jewish. Because the Jews, this was written, this was all in the Jewish context. So there's so much that we can't know because we're not Jewish. And we can learn it as we're going, but what if you knew all that in advance? Would that not be crazy? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So we're like... Can I tell the Dallas Willard story now, or are we too The Dillard long? story? Are we too, the Dillard story too long already. You can go ahead. I'll tell you a short story that this reminds me of, that I heard. Um, <clears throat> they wrote a book after Dallas Willard died of different people giving their stories about their interactions with Dallas Willard and how he affected their life. And there was one guy, can't remember his name at all, who was, um, so you know that Dallas Willard was a professor of philosophy, I think it was University of Southern California, and um, he was a secular professor, it wasn't a Christian college, it wasn't, he didn't teach from a Christian perspective per se, he kept it completely, uh, didn't talk about Christ in the classroom at all, or Christianity or anything like that, as I understand it. But what he did that was, was so cool, doing. he had a secret mission, you guys, he secretly taught people how to think in a way that laid the groundwork for the groundwork framework and groundwork, the for, foundation, the foundation and groundwork, groundwork, the framework. Anyways, so that you would 
had the because he was a very intellectual logical man and he could see like how you step out arguments that um explain why god exists and explain why christianity is um the truth of christianity so he would lay all the groundwork for this in your mind so that if you ever encountered the truth it would make sense to you because you knew how to think in a rational reasonable way and how the arguments form together so maybe you never encountered Christianity, but you got all this great thinking, the ability to think well. So there was this guy who was um, must have been a philosophy major and had had some classes with him. He was like his, one of his major professors. Um, and he was visiting a friend in his apartment and he saw his bookshelf and he saw one of Willard's books on the bookshelf. And he was like, he took it off and he says, Dallas Willard. And so then he looked at the picture and he said, this is my professor. I know this guy. He's, of course, he didn't even know he was a Christian. And the guy, the student, wasn't a Christian either. So he borrowed the book and read it. And, like, he got way more out of the book than any of us normal people get because he'd had all that ability to think in the way that allows you to that appreciate Dillard could think. what Dillard, the way he thought, because he was so brilliant. So I. So he was just doing a little trickety trick. <laughs> a good trick. The Stealth best mission. Kind of trick. The best kind. Yeah. So that, I think that reminds me of what you're talking about a little bit. And then when you read the Bible, it would blow your mind. Instead yeah. of the you New Testament, being, you mean? Yeah. You about Jesus. Being like, ah. Uh. Yeah. Because it says that one of the witnesses for Jesus was, well, his teachings, but also the scriptures were a witness to Jesus. And here's the thing. Me and Martha... And Michael, but he's not here. All work in Promised Land. We're all volunteer in Promised Land. We don't work. We volunteer. But um, a lot of the kids, especially the younger kids, I'm in the K3 room, don't like the lessons. And they don't like Bible stories. But we change that. So we're thinking about a team of scholars who understand the Old Testament and the culture who would be willing to design a curriculum, a for kids. curriculum for kids and think of the generation we could bring up. Uh, and, then, and it would be like, someday, children, you will get to read the New Testament when the time comes. And when you get there, it would be like, ah. I don't know when would be a good time. You can go. Sorry, we're having a distraction. I don't know where it is, Paul. We put you on hold. It's around somewhere. Okay, we're back. You don't know a good time what? That's the hold music. We were in the middle of a thought. I don't know what's a good time to have them read the New Testament. That's hard to decide. Because if they were older than fifth grade, then someone else would be have to be doing that. Because me and my older sister, Lizzie, well, she's going to college now, but not anymore. But me, I... And in the K3 room, and Martha and Michael are in the 4th and 5th grade room. But if they were in 6th grade or older when they read it, then someone else would be the ones leading them through it. It'd have to be a major we, overhaul. But think we about yourself in middle school. You we weren't, weren't ready in middle school for that. No, we weren't able to over... We High wouldn't school. be able to oversee that if it was not... This is all I'm Eileen. This if we did this in our church, it'd all be Eileen. Eileen, if you ever watch this, we love you, Eileen. We're talking to you. We'll probably tell her. We may tell you. Maybe you'll watch this. Maybe both. You know what? Maybe juniors. I think maybe juniors in high school. Oh, but how could you, how you couldn't? We can't keep the Bible out of middle school. Though. That would totally <laughs> ruin their whole thing. That would ruin all their sermons. <gasps> That's right, they're going to hear sermons. Hmm, maybe they start getting it leaked a little bit when you're in middle school. You get little peeks, sneak peeks. That, the sermons are what ruins it, you know what I mean? Okay, we've been... know it first. So, maybe it would have to be fifth grade. I think they're very No, you're smart, not ready so. in fifth grade. You're not emotionally ready. Think about yourself, all of your middle school years. You weren't ready? No, but I was not ready for anything. No one is. Middle school, it would be the, like, the worst time. Because everything is bad in middle school. Oh. Everything is bad in Upside middle school. Upside down. 
everyone is confused, and everyone sucks. Okay, I so... I love middle schoolers. We love you. We're so sorry for what you have to go through. <laughs> but... We love you. Middle school is always very weird. Chloe's had pretty good middle school, I think. But I think she'll still look back on it and be like, man, that was kind of weird. High school's better. Yeah. So, anyway... But it's just all it's just different. Comment. Yeah, he's comment. <laughs> Tell us what you think. You non-existent people. We wish you were there. Tell us what you think. This one is so long. No one will ever watch it. If God wants them to, they will. That's true. If someone, if you're there, please leave us a comment. We love you. And we love Jesus even more. Praise Jesus. He praises you. Praise you, Jesus. This is I love you in sign language, guys. This is peace, guys. Thank you.